I mean, I want to go to a weird place with this. We're already at a weird place. This is not normal. Welcome to the Witness Box, everybody. I'm your host, Joshua Diaz, and joined, as always, by Dr. Gary Bricado, a forensic psychologist, author of The New Evil, Chris McDonough as well, a seasoned homicide detective, both active with the Cold Case Foundation, both of their credentials speak for themselves. How's it going, Dr. Gary? How are you today? Very well. I I was just um, on Chris Cuomo. Um, on News Nation earlier, I was on the segment, you know, that sort of coincides with uh, Ray Tierney, the DA, the prosecution in the Harmon case. As far as I know, the defense didn't come out and say anything. I, I, I'm not aware of any statement that was made. But um, Rex Harmon, uh, who had already been charged with four murders, suggesting a pattern of serial sexual homicide. Um, was charged in two more cases that appear to be earlier and to involve a very different MO. And um, a bail document was released containing absolutely eye-popping and I think incontrovertibly damning um, information that Rex had been keeping on an electronic device, which we'll talk about. And... um, I think we'll have a lot of unique information on what might have been going on on the law enforcement side uh, from Chris's experience, and I'll be able to speak to what I think we're seeing about the psychology of this offender, and um, and we can address some big heated questions right now, like does anybody really believe this guy had only six victims, or you know what about the rest of the people at Gilgo that are found dead? Are they his? Or what the heck were they doing with the second search of the house? You know, things like that. And uh, Chris, what are your thoughts? Well, good evening uh, or good afternoon to everybody, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the first impressions I had uh, was, Gary, you and I had talked about uh, right away, what were your impressions of him? And again, like you did with others, uh, you nailed him uh, saying that he and I agreed with you that he would have multiple victims, and the, this is just the opening of the floodgates, I think, at this point. You also related that his early victims would be dismembered, uh, and we're seeing evidence in this bail document now that that is exactly the case. Uh, and, in fact, he has a, you know, a, um, a PowerPoint almost on how to do this, how to successfully you know, dismember and how to uh, end up, you know, disposing of the human body in relationship to these poor victims. Uh, But uh, I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation today. Um, So my first impression has always been, uh, well done, good job, Doc. That's why you do what you do. And I can't wait to... uh, yeah. hear more of your thoughts in this and Josh's, Josh's uh, as we go along here. I mean, I don't, I, it's pretty, yeah, I'm very, very interested in what you both have to say about this because uh, this is something that I think is going to just drop the jaws of people. Well, um, Chris and I had also said on the interview room, and I have to say, you know, if you look at the armchair sleuths that comment and, and other podcasts, we took some heat for saying, people, I, and I mean like full-throated laughing at us, we said that that gun vault, that soundproofed gun vault, was probably a torture chamber. And if you look at this document, it leads one um, to the conclusion that he was very aware of the soundproofing of a room because it would make a perfect place to, quote-unquote, play with a victim. And um, that you the, the more the better the soundproofing, the more time you could have. And I think at this point, you know, I feel kind of vindicated by you know for all the the, the people saying that that was ridiculous. There is nobody yeah. on YouTube immature enough to mock professionals who work actual cases. There's not one I could even think of. Um, well, okay. Well, uh, let's just say there are some I wish I didn't think of. But it's um, 
but but I think we're going to have to walk through this, and I think we should take a moment and acknowledge the victims, uh, Sandra Costilla and Jessica Taylor. And um, what it now looks like is that these cases go back to at least 1993, um, which would have made Rex just a little bit younger than 30. And I can tell you that men who commit serious sexual homicide on average begin killing at about 26. That's the average that came from, I believe, the serial killer database study at Florida Gulf Coast and Radford universities. So I wouldn't put them too far off, but I still think that six is the tip of the iceberg. Um, because the first question that jumps out is, what are we saying? That this guy was dormant from 1993 to the end of the century, and then dormant again until like the mid, you know, the middle of the first decade of that century, the next century, and then, you know, in other words, Chris, with everything we know about men who commit serial killing, do they have uh, cooling off periods of years and years? Or, I mean, have you ever, I mean, outside of like BTK? But even him, I mean, what, right? He, he had cooling off periods, but he had all of his fantasy materials, you know, his, his photographs and stuff. Uh, but here, in this particular case, one of the things I think you'll find interesting, all of us, is the fact that he disposes, he puts in a post-event, dispose of pics. And that tells me that this guy has had 30 years. If he started it, you know, to your point, Dr. Bricado, the ages of 26 on. So he's had 34 years if he's 60 years old now. And if this goes back 34 years, this becomes, this document showing his behavior uh, where, and in his mind, deep into his mind, uh, he is learning in those 34 years, and he's become a master of torture and a master of horror. And, and Chris, I think, learned with the part nobody is saying out loud is that he actually learned from the writings of colleagues of ours. Yes. Colleagues, people we know. Yes. How to make a crime scene look like someone else's output. Yes. And then it, how to make a scene look more disorganized or more organized or an indication of inadequacy in the offender or et cetera to throw the profiler off. Yeah. And imagine and being that cool-headed after killing someone that you're taking the time to be concerned about that and that you're able to, I mean, you have to imagine a, somebody with the, the dead soul of a, of a stone. I mean, just dead in the soul. I mean, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, he's the, but he's so meticulous. Like an architect, yeah. like an architect. Yeah. And that his, the death of this soul, uh, has been dead for quite some time internally for him. Yet he's able to project uh, this persona into the public of a very successful architect, a father with a family on Long Island, you know, just, and everybody looks at him as if, as if he's a pillar of society, yet in his secret life, he's, you know, he has a, a, a whole category of problems, for an example. And, and he lists all these problems that he has adapted from studying guys like us, uh, but right. to avoid detection and avoid arrest. And guess what? He's been very successful at it because he had 30 something years. And so was Dennis Rader until ultimately he was caught and they unraveled that piece of yarn to right. discover what was there. Well, well, Chris, he even thinks of things like make sure you don't need to stop to refill gas. Yep. You and know. don't charge. Don't or, charge. Yeah, it. don't charge them either. Yeah. Right. Don't charge them. Really, really careful. And there are some things on the list I think we should review because only somebody in law enforcement would understand. Uh, and I, I thought that would be a really interesting little subtopic for the conversation. So, for example, if you look 
at exhibit B at the bottom. This is a list that I think you and I should go through. Um, and it says under problems, we certainly understand DNA, tire marks, blood stains, fingerprints. The first one that I can imagine somebody having a little confusion about is the part about cat litter. That absorbs body fluids. Exactly. So in other words, the he even thought to bring that along and probably figured it would look like a pretty benign thing to have in your car if you're pulled over or something, right? Yep. Because so, this guy must have been carrying around a kit. Yes. Would say, uh, probably in his trunk or something. Okay, so that was the first one. And then it says witness. Of course, we understand that. Trace source of supplies. Now, I think I understand what that means, but maybe you want to explain to the audience. It's, you know, credit card receipts. Where did he buy it? Any kind of sources that would be connected back to where the items were purchased. Right. And then foot and shoe prints, photos with a question mark. Misleaders, I thought was extremely interesting because it implies that he took the time to plant red herrings. Uh, did you interpret that any other way? You know, I'm not. I'm not really sure how to take that one yet. I just assumed it meant plant stuff to give people the wrong impression. Okay. Uh, but how else might you interpret it? It's very interesting. Yeah, like he wants to, but you see, that's a problem for him. So I think that would have been more on, you know, the, the pre-prep side that we'll get into in a little bit. But okay. yeah, I hear, I hear where you're coming or where you're going with that, Gary, but well, I don't quite wrap my mind around that one. So I understand that he says what he would do at a police stop. And I understand about, the, I guess I'd like to know what you think he means by truck stuff. Truck well, stuff. you know, what's interesting is it's a beach area. Is this, what if he's taking that truck uh, onto the sand to dump the bodies? Oh, officer, I can't move it. Truck is right. stuck. That kind of truck is stuck. Uh, right. So that could be a problem for him. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And then fingerprints in gloves. Yep. It's not That's uncommon, by right. the way. Plastic bags matched to box. Meaning the box that they're sold in. You can yeah. sometimes, you know, yeah. connect uh, the the tearing of the bag out of the box. Interesting. Oh, that's really interesting. Now, hair and fiber we get, although that probably was his undoing. And then um, under supplies, I thought it was very interesting that he did something that the Zodiac Killer did, which is where he has a misspelling that almost feels like it was an inside joke. Uh where instead of spelling lie, L-Y-E, uh, correctly, he spells it as L-I-E uh, because it's a deceptive, it's being used deceptively. That's a kind of, just like, you know, that's, Zodiac did that all the time. And um, I don't know if that's a coincidence if he just didn't spell correctly, like he spelled scanner wrong in the next line. Uh, but part of me wondered if that was a little, like to make himself seem less educated or, I mean, he's an architect. You would think that he could spell. It's odd. It's very odd. Although he may be so visual that he lacks verbal ability. There are a lot of psychopaths like that. They're as visual, visual as a tiger, but they can't spell or they have attention. Now, Chris, um, is there anything Ooh. under supplies or DS or TRG that you think people would find confusing? To be honest, um, the TRG section is very disturbing. Um, but I'd like to know if you look... because. I thought that might mean target, but uh, to what T one target one is Megan. Is that the one you're talking about? You think that TRG means target? Find uh, that I in mean, the. It says, oh, it's under in the same place we were just looking with the problem supplies. It says TRG T one Megan with a question mark. Small is good. T U N K black, and I thought that meant something like unknown. Or something um, like target unknown black that he might have spied a black woman he was interested in killing or something but mm -hmm. the small is good is very disturbing to me um, makes me think well, that you, he, yeah, well, you have he, the you have problem supplies uh, DS which is dump site and TRG I, which right. would be target well I think so I think DS means dump site 
But notice under supplies, Chris, it says photo film. Yes. That's very, very important. I mean, th that's a dead giveaway. Like when Chris Cuomo said to me tonight, what was the motive? Well, clearly the motive is fantasy. The expression repetitively of domination, control, and manipulation over a repetitive string of women on whom you are symbolically taking out some score you want to settle. And they have to kind of look alike, right? Okay, so he's like killing the same woman over and over again, basically, right? It's symbolically. That's the motive. So then why would you take pictures? Well, to cherish the moment, kind of like the way we might cherish a wedding day or something, right? So then where are the photos? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I and I've just found it on page 23 that TRG refers to victims or target so you you're correct you think so okay and then so then chris it's very disturbing that this guy would actually record that there was a megan and that yeah. the that there was a what looks like an unknown african-american potential victim and that this thing of small is good tells you something because we have always thought that he went for small women either because they were easy to dominate or because yep. they look like children. Yep, dominance and control. Small is good. Could it, could it be both? Absolutely. But yeah. what do you think, Chris? I, I'm very suspicious about. I'm very worried about his daughter in this picture. Well, and, but here he's selecting his victimology, and we're actually we're into his mind. Right. I was going to say you're literally on the inside of his mind. You're inside to his head. Yeah, for sure. And you know, we go back to you know photo film. I this may be crazy, but he knows that digital can be traced, but photo film is much more difficult to trace. But because if we go down into his preparation down here, he's evolving into the 21st century. Yes. By by looking at recon videos and cameras. So he's become he's adapting to his hunting environments by looking around for right. camera and maybe he went back to what he knows works i.e photo film just you know a regular camera uh, but then again down here he has post event uh disposal right. pics get well, rid of them. so this is the most disturbing part i think beyond the references to torture and the needing the quiet place to do it and play with the victim i thought that this when you read some of the supplies he took i think some of them hint at bringing stuff he needed to destroy the body like tarps and things like that and then you move down and you read this pre-prep prep and post event and you realize that the whole thing was this like perfectly orchestrated organized defense where he even makes notes about how to basically, you know, stalk a person, isolate them, fool them, and then destroy them. And, um, you know, Chris, I, he had to have studied. I mean, like, for example, the pre-prep, and I really want your thoughts on this because some of the abbreviations I don't understand, to be honest. But, like, for example, like the thing about the weather report, I can understand that the recon video cameras, picking the zone for the video cameras. I get all of that. But what does he mean at the top? The vehicle inspection, the engaged target one, recon, you know, locate. What does DS mean? Dump, Dump time. Time. Yeah. Okay, so I get you. So in other words, what, what do you think the vehicle inspection? Means? That he make, is making sure that everything is good to go. He's articulate in terms of Got it. It, it's kind of like a cop you know when you go 10 8 what they used to call it the you would do a what they call a five point shotgun check yeah and you would, you would take your weapons out and you check everything and make sure that everything is working lights sirens all of this stuff and you check everything this guy is literally going through that type of inspection on every operation who doesn't want to get out on the road and have a tail light go out or have a bad tail light and give anybody right. any excuse to look at him and and oh that's really and and then what do you think about that 
he recons the dump site and then he locates it. Does that mean that he researched it on the internet or something and then he actually goes and finds it? Could it be? Could be. So, so he is picking a target that he thinks is attractive and meets his prototype, as I call it, his prototype criteria, lures them to a location that he has scoped out for where he's going to dump them. And when they are dead, wherever... So that would imply that he may have killed some of them outside the home. Well, not only where he's going to pick the... Where he's going to kill them and dump them, but he's also got a pick zone. You'll see they're under Uh pre-prep. Recon pick zone for video cameras. So he is setting the stage. And if we look at prep, set up stage. I.e., he's creating a ruse. Oh, I see in a certain geographic region and he's going to take them back to a, another crime scene location i.e a secondary crime scene which he is to, entitled the holding area now is that holding area our soundproof room that we said you know and long before anybody else that does this guy have this little holding area and does he use it as a torture chamber but here we see the under the prep section build a table has a crossbar and a hard point okay so he is literally utilizing these were this verbiage to show that he's going to hold that victim That's in cool. place uh, for what is whatever he's going to do and then if we go back up to the top we look at his supplies you know, some of this is post-incident. Some of this, I think, would be torturous of some sort. Large electrical electrical clips. Is is he utilizing those on a battery source? You know, what's going on with this guy on this thing? Uh, the the other thing I I think is fascinating here into his head under DS at the top dump site. He says, next time recon dumpster locations. So would these would this victim, DS1, Mill Road, and dump site two, he hadn't identified it. So he was spontaneous in his dump site. But he if yeah. he has dismembered this gal, he did he didn't think through it. And that's where he puts in there next time recon so he's thinking already after he's dismembered this person and thrown him to wherever he put him that you know what i made a mistake i gotta make a note and study what i did on this one i i would submit to you this is this is one plan for t target one megan this is her plan of probably destruction well, Chris, the, there are offenders that have used large electrical clips on women. Um, for example, David Parker Ray, one of the worst torturers in yeah. history. Vernon Gaberth called him, uh, I'm trying to remember what he used to say. When you asked Vernon Gaberth, he would say, clinically, he's a psychopath, spiritually, he's the devil on earth. Well, uh, that, you know, that's how bad he was. And um, he would put... I praise. He, he would put electrical clips onto the breasts of victims with a battery and jolt them. Uh, and there were other offenders who did that. Apparently, the electrocution of the breasts is not, a, you know, is a typical torture for some of these. Not typical, but when electricity is used, it's the sexual zones that are tortured with it. Um, there is also reference in this document to toys and wooden objects. Uh, one gets the sense that he had a ritual with a whole bag of objects that he would use. And I understand from the document that there was some interest in foreign body insertion. So my guess is that he is either not actually penetrating and is using objects to do that, or he is at least inflicting pain with objects. Mm -hmm. Um, There's also reference in the document to a victim that he hanged and the rope snapped. So he, he learned from that about how to hang the victim. So there must have been some of that slow asphyxiation with hanging, um, like we saw with Jerry Brudos, who would slightly lift the feet from the ground and 
watch a person choke. Now, the one thing that really, really, really got me, because I, I wrote a chapter for a new book on offenders who use photography, that is very odd to me, is why would a person take pictures if they were only going to destroy them afterward, as he says in this document? And the only thing I could think of is that the taking of the photos was part of the torture. Uh, David Parker Ray forced victims to watch themselves on a camera being tortured. Uh, um, another example was Robert Ben Rhodes, right. uh, the, who photographed victims dying as part of the psychological torment. Right. You know, uh, and so I wonder if part of this, Chris, is not necessarily to keep trophies and mementos because he's going to get rid of them. If it, it may be part of it is to scare and horrify and humiliate. You know, I'm going to send this to your family. I'm going to publish this. Everyone's going to see your naked body dead in a true crime book one day. You know, mm -hmm. like just like this L.A. police department scrapbook. See, see these dead bodies. You're going to be just like that with your breasts exposed. You know, you get what I'm saying? Yep. It, it be psychological torture. I'm, I'm going to say something here that I think will be very interesting to see if it comes to fruition. I'm going to submit this is an operation plan this HK2002-04, okay, on whatever, Exhibit B. This is an, op if we take a 30,000 foot view and look down, yeah. we see an operation plan for Target 1, Megan. Okay? She, whoever this Megan was and is in his mind. Ah, I see. Okay. So all He's, the black. Is that the um, so Megan is small and black. The fact well, that she's small, she's small, fact, yeah. small is good. Okay, if Megan doesn't work out, target number two, unknown, is a black gal. But this plan is for Megan, and if we if you look back in the document, they identified Mill Road is where one of the victims was found. And here under dump site number two, he's got a question mark of, well, I'm not sure where I'm going to dump this, dump her, you know, dump site. So next time, I'm making a note here in parentheses, next time recon dumpster locations so that he knows. And so now we look at this now as almost like a flight plan submitted to the control tower. But this is You're not... Waterman? Well, it, Megan it could be. I don't know who Megan is, right? It, it could be Megan Waterman. But this is her operation plan in his head. Do I have, what are my problems with if, when I get Megan? All of these things, DNA, blah, blah, blah. You know, and the truck stop stuck on this one is really interesting because if she if she's down at the beach, then he was already thinking ahead that I can't get the truck stop stuck. And then we go into the supplies. Well, we know what he used. He put it on paper here. And oh, now oh, but but Chris, 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 I just remembered yeah. something. Okay, Megan go. Megan Waterman's boyfriend was black. Say what? Megan Waterman's boyfriend was black. She had a baby with a black man. Okay. So I'm wondering if that's what that means. That he's looking at Megan. And she's got an unknown black guy with her. Okay, so maybe he's already thinking ahead. Okay, do I have to take this guy out? The black right. guy. I, what was his name? Akeem? He, he, I he, don't he, he's African American or Hispanic, dark skinned. He was a pimp also. Okay. He was a friend and her pimp. Okay, so That's he already awesome. knows, though. He yeah. already knows where he's going to go. Now we get down into, he's identified the targets. Now we get into his his pre preparation, i.e., his recon check. He inspects his vehicle. He's got to, you know, okay. How am I going to engage the uh, the target? Okay, what am I going to say? I.e., what's my setup? Okay. Where where uh, I've got to recon the dump site before I go get her. 
I'm going to drive by to make sure everything's copacetic. The weather looks good. We're good to go. I'm reconning any videos on my way in. Okay? And then I also going to recon the pickup zone here. Okay? The pickup zone. And so he's going to check that for cameras. And now he's in the preparation in his head. Okay? The setup stage. What roost am I going to use? How am I going to get this? Am I going to call her? What's the deal? How are we going to go here? Okay. Where am I going to hold her when I get her? How's that going to work? Hmm. Okay, here's what I got to do. I got to get the table. I got to build the table, get it all ready. I got to get the crossbar on the table. I got to get a hard point on the table so I can handcuff her or tire or whatever he's going to do. And now he's already thought ahead of that into the post event where this is really interesting. He says, destroy file. So that's a singular event. That's a singular event. He need, he knows he needs to change his car tires. So did he have revolving tires that he utilized? And he knows to get burned the gloves and get rid of any pictures he may taking taken and then get his story set and have it set. Yeah, and that's what I, I was wondering about that too with the tire situation. I mean, so yeah. every every time he commits an act, he he swaps the tires out. He gets new ones. What I mean, I wondered that, about that too. I thought Chris would know. So well, now but let's look at this for a second, Gary. Look at this one under recon reports. He has done recon thirty three times. Yeah. Oh, and and by the way, the, remember it says these are multiples. This is plural. Now, we're just talking about six people so far. He's talking about 33 times he's gone out. Recon reports. He's got 33, either 33 cameras that he's identified, okay, but they're old. And on Parkway 231 to exit 30, there are 10 cameras maybe that he's identified. Ten, he, he's identified 10 cameras, and this is what's really interesting. He's identified cell phone. He's got her cell phone number. Right. And, and her voice. beeper voicemail. So, and that's her old one. So this well, goes so back a while. He, he would do that. He would call people if somebody, you know, after, after killing a victim, he'd call, you know, a relative, yeah. kind of torment them and so forth. So, you know, God only knows what he was doing, but I assume that this info was, this is the info given on some kind of ad uh, for John that was interested uh, because uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, she was working as a sex worker with the boyfriend operating as the pimp, correct? Megan, I mean, I'm suspicious that this is Megan Waterman that's being talked about. I'd like to correlate the facts with what's here to see, Chris, if you're right. That this was the Megan plan, but I think I think the boyfriend's last name is Cruz. My guess is that he was of Hispanic origin and was dark skinned, and the client, the um, the killer, um, assumed he was African American because it, that's what it looks like he's saying in the notation that there's an unknown black associated with her. And I also think physically she was small, and the small is good makes sense. But I, I really think this is Megan Waterman, I, unless it's an unknown Megan. Where was Megan's body discovered? Was uh, it discovered uh, off of Mill Road? Uh, I can, I can bring that she was a sex worker. She was working about 20 miles from the Holiday Inn in Hop Hog. That's where she was last seen. Um, they looked for her for months. And then uh, Officer John Malia and his German Shepherd scent dog blue we're in the area doing a training exercise walking on the shoulder of ocean parkway about five miles west of where shannon gilbert was last seen blue picks up a scent they venture into the scrub brush north of the road about 30 feet find a burlap bag it's got skeletal remains two days later um they find three more sets etc and then that's where you have your group uh, okay so on victim. page 23 yeah. We get, with regards to the dump site section of the document, it's important to note that the human remains of Jessica Taylor 
discovered in 2003, as well as the remains of Valerie Mack discovered in 2000, were dumped in two locations. One of those locations being the vicinity of Mill Road, which is listed DS1 Mill Road in the work document. Okay. So they're tying in this document Mill Road to potentially Valerie Mack. Okay. But on this, but on his report. Right. Okay. He says that he's trying to pick a a target by the first name question mark Megan. Right. And there is a victim Megan. Right. So I don't know that was the victim Megan near Mill Road. Do we know? Well, it says if you go to page let's see go to page 23 and you see they've highlighted with the red and the blue to try to understand the notation right it says is that what you were referring to chris have you read that through i'm going up to it now so it says with regards to the ds section of the document it is important to note that the human remains of jessica taylor discovered in 2003 as well as the remains of valerie mack discovered in 2000 were dumped in two locations one of those locations being the city of Mill Road. This is what you were just reading from, right? right, right but then, you know, we have to look at what it says about the TRG section to understand that that's not the name of Valerie or Jessica, right? Correct. So we have to find out what it, what they say in this document about the TRG. So what are they thinking? Well, the TRG means party. Right, but how are they explaining that Megan, the, the victim Megan, was not associated with that dump site. Well, exactly. That's my question because they're saying that right. Valerie Mac right. is associated with Mill Road. And she hasn't been charged. They didn't charge for Valerie Mac. They went okay. with the other, probably because it's too confusing. They went okay. with Jessica Taylor and, and Sandra Castillo, but they did not charge Valerie Mac. Valerie Mac is the victim that I thought they were going to charge. When I heard in the news there were going to be two victims charged uh, uh, today, I thought it was going to be Valerie Mack and Jessica Taylor. And to my great shock, it was Sandra Castillo and Castilla and Jessica Taylor. So, and it may be because this is not clear, Chris. Well, I I don't know if you if you if you take a, a thirty thousand foot view looking down, and and you look at this as a big picture for him, right. not big picture for us as law enforcement, right. right? That get into his head. Why does he have all these categories, these subcategories, right. and then steps within those subcategories? This is right. a checklist for him. Checklist, exactly. It's exactly. A, it's like it's like a flight plan. Okay, so right. under yeah. his target on his checklist. His target is T1 Megan, question mark. And that means, can I get her? Or is this going to be a problem? Okay. Do I have a, do I have a problem? But she's small. That's good. So that's it. That's right. Adva right. Advantage Rex. Right. Okay. Right. And there's this African-American guy with her. And I don't know. Target, who he is. target unknown. He's a black guy. Right. Okay. That seems to be the point. Yeah. And okay. right. right now, and now we go into the second step on this is the the pre prep stuff, and then he's got his notes down here. I'm just wondering if he didn't print this out at every opera that, and as Raider used to call him, every operation. Okay, and the, and just go ahead. No, no, go, go. Okay, because now we go from. You know, he's done all these recon reports to the preparation, and now we got post events. Okay. And what are those post events? Body preparation. Right. Okay. And Disturbing. so he, and now he also has in post event, right? Target one's clothing and personal items, drop cloths, tools, devices, oh, yeah. wipes and towels, props, toys, 
wood items, Ugh. anything that touched T1, what you wore, i.e. him, destroy book and computer files, i.e. does he keep an operations book like this? Okay. Does he have a checklist like this? Yeah. Okay. I got to burn the glove, dispose a box of plastic bags to avoid tracing it. Things, things to remember. Sound travels, birds outside, control the amount of air in and out to control the noise made. Okay. These are very specific. Very specific. I love this word, get sleep before hunt. Too tired creates too many problems. That, that, one, hunt is, that is wild. I, it's, he has operated on not very much sleep before while doing this and knows that he enjoys it and you get more time. Uh, he refers to it, doesn't he refer to it as playtime with the victim? I think that word yeah. is somewhere in the document, yes. But, but I have to say, Chris, that I think the reason there's that discrepancy with Megan and the thing... I think what it looks like to me, now I, I could be totally wrong, but it looks like to me that that's when he was looking at Megan Waterman, was concerned about who the African-American or Hispanic man was that was with her, that he calls the unknown, likes that she's small, and is thinking, should I put her in the dump site, which is with the ones that I dismembered earlier that are on Mill Road or whatever, or should I try this new dump site, which hasn't been developed yet, and that's the question marks, blah, 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 which we know becomes the Gilgo foresight, right, where they're in the burlap. So it makes me think that what you're seeing there is the thought process that preceded targeting Megan Waterman. And um, what do you think about that hypothesis? I, I think it's great, but I think he yeah. is targeting dumpsters oh, yeah. for, the, for when he cuts them up. That's he why dumps, he's the target. He, dump, all the he dumps... The first dump site is the torso on Mill Road, dump site one. Dump site two potentially could be the hands, the head, all the other things. And he is going around looking for dumpsters to throw them in. And probably oh. in multiple jurisdictions so that they're across lines of... Yeah, he, yeah. he's already done that recon. You'll notice down there in his recon report, if he takes right. 112... To 110, there are 33 cameras, but they're old. So he's crossing his fingers. But yeah. once he has this, once he has this data, okay, the one question I have, and I would have asked him, is, hey, Rex, do, when you got all this data, did you go back and confirm it every time, or was this just kind of a, you know, a stale document, not a living document? Wow. You know, and, and see what he says. Because here he's got... Uh, Look at this. Under body prep, remove trace DNA, remove trace evidence, remove ID marks, tattoos, remove marks from torture. We have evidence 100% that he tortures his victims. We hypothesized, Chris. When right. said that, people said that was a leap of logic. Of course he did. This was serial sexual sadism. Yes. And, uh, and uh, you know, there are certain degrees of it that people can use that are... But if you put the pieces together in here, there were multiple uh, methods of torture. He was like a kid in a candy shop. Once he had a victim isolated, he must have had a whole series of supplies that he used and recorded somehow. Uh, and, and, you know, for whatever reason, either as part of the torture or as a memento, I don't know about the this part. So you see where it says where he's taking notes from the writings of John Douglas. Right. Red Mind Hunter, the cases that haunt us. Now, of course, um, you know, the different true crime programs that invite me on or, or are right talking about this, they don't know how famous these books are, right? John Douglas is like household name in the world of true crime. Uh, of course, the founder of our Cold Case Foundation, uh, you know, the Mind Hunter himself, right? The founder of the BSU. And um, I don't think it's unusual for offenders to read the writings of people like John, like myself, like Dr. Burgess, like Dr. Co you know, Greg Cooper. Yeah, like Gary, they're reading the new evil as we sit here. You and I both know that. Oh, I, I, I know for sure that, that there are offenders that have read it. They read these things. And John Douglas, of course, is very famous. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this guy watched Mindhunter 
on television and so forth. Um, he probably had a, a kind of library of true crime books that just looked like he was interested, like an aficionado. But the thing is, um, he learns from that book that mutilating a victim is a, like a kind of a sign of disorganization. Now, what Anne and Victor and Burgess and Victor Patricka and I learned in doing research on dismemberment and mutilation is that actually it can be a very organized thing to do if you are doing it to get rid of evidence. And if you're doing it to get rid of evidence, you usually just have to get rid of tattoos, teeth, the head, hands, and that is exactly the kind of dismemberment we saw here and mutilation we saw. So what it looks like to me is, is that initially he was getting rid of the bodies and he later advanced into someone who started keeping them and probably visiting them in the burlap, you know, which may have been used to kind of slow down decay or something like that. Now, um, Chris, I don't know what you think about that, but I think he evolved from a dismemberer to somebody that kept them. Well, look at look to your point, Gary. Look at this, where he has page one seventy five mutilation equals disorganization. He he deducted exactly what you just said. There you go. Right. He knew. Okay. He, knew. he knew. Right. He he knew. Right. And to the point where you know, okay, he would do all of these other things, you know, remove the tattoos, marks, et cetera, uh, remove the head hands, and then package for transport. And he calls it package for transport. That's an interesting selection of words. Sounds like something Dennis Rader would say with that total objectification, like the person's an object. Now, that's not like something he would say about moving furniture or pieces of building material. Now, Chris, I have to tell you, to get into something that's been very hot in the news that I think you and I can uniquely discuss is why did the paper say that when they did the second search, they took paint chips? Now, I hypothesize that someone was dismembered in that house and yep. blood spattered on the wall, and it was painted over. And yep. they want to see if they can match the blood. Now, I want to know if from an investigative perspective, that's a ridiculous statement. I happen to know that you can get luminol, use luminol or something on blood stains that go back even over a century. They, they recently found blood stains in the Lizzie Borden house, right, from the end of the 19th century. So I'm wondering if you agree with me, and, and there's nothing, we don't know what he did in the torture, but it seems to me that blood that shot where you would, you know, take paint chips might be more associated with cutting up a body. Now, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on this? Does this make any sense or far I, I totally agree because he has under dispose of the following drop cloths. Yeah, right. There okay, you know. why do you need that, right? And then he also has in here tools and devices. So he's going to get rid of them. And anything that like, that, like a saw, things like that. Like anything. Saw, yeah. Whatever. Right. Uh -huh. But he also has in here wood items. And I think you and I talked about this a while ago, that if he had anything wood in there, okay, in the torture chamber, then obviously he's gotten rid of that. However, if he did one of the victims in the house and got blood all over the, the walls or whatever, that blood can absorb into the porousness of that wood. And you can paint over it as much as you want. That's right. And, and, and it would still be now basically, uh, just think of it like a resin and you found a fly from a you know 300 million years ago yeah right it's the same principle well, it it would be embedded in that well what's interesting chris is that one of the books he was clearly studying it's there are pictures of it in the thing is the cases that haunt us now this is a douglas book written but with mark Olshaker that talks about historical cases that are intriguing now, why would he study that? Well, first of all, the John Benet Ram Ramsey case is in there. It's a child murder, and she has wood inserted into her. Remember, she was garroted with a 
piece of wood and there is this idea that a paint stick was inserted vaginally remember that i i am convinced that this guy was engaging in foreign object insertion and because his father was the cabinet maker with him remember the whole thing wood figures into this guy's psyche in a very perverse way i think wood and ropes and certain belts and things like that they figure into this guy's psychology i don't know if he was disciplined with belts or spanked with wood or if he built things with his dad out of wood i don't know what it is he says that he did that he made cabinets with his father he did woodworking with the father so the notion that wood figures into this guy's torture is very very interesting to me and my sense if he's guilty is that it was probably stuff that was used for insertion now in that book you've got john benet ramsey assaulted with wood you also have the black dahlia who is dismembered and dumped on the lawn right after having been carried in a trunk by the way and um you have the Lindbergh baby, you have the Lizzie Borden case, you have Jack the Ripper in there, right? In other words, there are these cases that just kind of never quite got solved, but some of them have themes that I could see very being very interesting to this guy. Well, the other the other thing is interesting here yeah. under things to remember. Mm -hmm. I'm going to submit to you this is a post-incident breakdown of his own critique. Because look at this. He goes, sound travels, i.e. birds outside, bird outside. So the question here is control the amount of air in and out to control the noise made. Now, what does that mean? Either he is controlling his breathing himself so that he's not disrupting the outside environment, which would tip him off. So he's lowering his risk or he's trying to control the victim and control her breathing or whoever the victim is exactly. so, that, so that so it can go either way. But here here's why I would submit it's about him versus her, because the next sentence or the next bullet point is get sleep before the hunt. If too tired creates problems. So he's he is self he is self-preparing almost like an athlete who envisualizes their events you know if you want to hit home runs close your eyes and watch that home run go okay in in his situation he may be doing controlled breathing exercises okay that's just a hypothesis right now but then look at number three hit harder too many hits to take down. Consider a hit to the face or neck next time for takedown. I.e., you know what? It didn't work as well the last time uh, or this time. So I got to work on that. And then he's got more sleep and noise control equals more playtime. Yeah, that's what I was referring to earlier with the playtime. And which is... It, it, this is haunting because he's he's basically saying the noise control. If he can keep the the noise to a minimum, he can ha he has longer to do whatever sick things that he's doing. Right? Is that is that what days? It's entirely yeah. possible that a victim was taken to that soundproof room he had. I mean, the wife could have been home. People could have been walking around. He could have had somebody in a soundproof room and say, "Honey, I'm going down to the vault." And had somebody in there. He may have had somebody enslaved. It's like it's like every right. horror movie they ever made. Well, there are a lot of offenders who kept captives. Sexual enslavement is a thing. I mean, it, you right? Know, there but, it is, yeah. but, but but it's entirely possible that um, the takedown Chris refers to a blitz attack, like a Ted Bundy style thing, where he's schmoozing and trying to hit, and then he pounces and walks well, right. Dr. Very, very quickly. Uh, yeah. How long would it? So he he mentions Stockholm syndrome, which, by right. the way, isn't. Before we go okay. there, I yeah, yeah, let, we'll go there if if that's oh, yeah, okay. That's a great question. Yeah, but but let's go to go back to more sleep and noise control. We know he's projecting here that he got tired, okay? because this is this is this is past tense. 
I need more sleep and that will help with the noise control. Right. I so. need the victim is getting too loud. Okay. And that gives me more playtime equals. Remember he's doing math here in his head about each one of his behaviors. If I get more sleep and I can control the noise a little bit better, I get more playtime. One plus one equals two. Well, okay. and also it goes right back up to where he says hit harder because right. he, he was probably tiring himself out as well. Right. He's talking about uh, that great point. And now he goes, use push pins to hang drop cloths now from ceiling. So going back to your point earlier, Gary, where are all the, where, where could be the wood pieces that he could push push pins into? Okay. That would be a question I would have as an investigator. I'd say, yeah. you know, if he's got access, where's he going to put the push pins into? Into the drywall? Into wood? Does he have trim? You know, what's he got up there? Because he's definitely said here, I'm not using tape again. Okay. And now this one. And that is, was his undoing, Chris. Huh? Hair got stuck. That was his undoing because hair has got stuck under tape. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He's not wrong. Yeah. To hang drop cloths. Yeah, but okay. do you think that's the re that's not the reason that he didn't want to use tape? Was well, it just kept evolving and learning and getting better? I, what's so mm -hmm. fascinating about this case is that you're watching an offender in real time that was active for, for probably so long that you see the overlap with the growing technology to catch offenders and this guy changing his MO to actually right. outpace the He's technology. Adopting. He is literally adapting, you know, to and um, it, that is fascinating to me because it's right at the heart of new evil and a lot of ideas I think about. Michael Stone thought about this guy is like it's like when a when a, a paleontologist finds like that perfect specimen that right. proves that there was a period between two species that that suggests there really was an evolution or something. Right. He really is changing. And we're, so but Chris, what did he need? What did he need drop cloths for? Well, dismemberment and or disposal. Right. Or maybe to make the videos and cameras look better. The, the film, the, the, the thing look better. Yeah. I mean, he's right. probably buying tarps. Yeah, I think for dismemberment too. I agree with you. But. May, maybe now the burlap makes sense, you know, to where he's wrapping them up in these burlap bags. Uh, and because, you know, he, he has it in there, remember, under body prep package for transport okay and so uh, also in here after the push pins he's got use heavy rope for neck uh light rope broke under the stress of being tightened uh we don't know if that was manually or if he was hanging them i mean i don't know what the the top says does it say he was hanging them well, i.e the, in the uh, bill document well, 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 remember that, um, no, no, see, because it's complicated because technically speaking, I mean, I want to go to a weird place with this, but technically speaking, he could have been pulling a Dennis Raider and engaging in some of this rope stuff auto erotic. Uh, yeah, we're already at a weird place. Trust well, me. This is, true. this is not normal. Right. He could have been experimenting on himself like Dennis Raider style, you know, getting off on auto erotic stuff or whatever. But all we know is he could be referring to a victim. That he really i think he is but we don't know but all i know is this guy would experiment with suspending a person probably to control the breathing and slowly kill them like jerry brutos would do as i said earlier and it looks like if a person is just a little bit heavy or you're tightening too much the the rope can snap and you don't have the desired effect so he's literally learning to be better at what he does with ropes Right. That's why I'm saying this is a. That's why I'm saying this is, a, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but looking at this for the very first time tonight, yeah. in my opinion, this is a single incident operation plan. Because look at his, look what he describes as the problems, just like an architect after an inspection of one of his houses, take down pickup. Hunt too long, seen an area too long. So do you think Remember? he has one of these for each victim? I think so. It won't surprise me. Because he's got a book 
And each time he gets rid of destroy the book and the computer files. So, yeah. and, and look at this one here. Remember, don't charge gas. And look at the bottom one. Recon for video cameras in pickup area next time. The very bottom. So this is a single event that he's thinking through, in my opinion. This, this, might, is, have been, this might have been Megan Waterman, Chris. This might have well, been well, and I think, poor woman. And I think this could be a cut and paste, Gary, to some of the you know yeah. other events. Okay, things to remember, yeah. that kind of stuff, you know, cut and paste over, you know, into these documents. But he makes it clear there. That in the pick, he felt that he didn't do enough recon in the pickup area. Ima imagine this going to trial, and they have like I wouldn't say for everybody, like say, say he ends up with you know I don't know ten victims or more, and they have this roadmap of each single one. I, I mean, how does he, how does he not just cop? Uh, well, it, my question is, Gary, that, where where does Megan fall in the sequence here? Well, uh, let's see. I'll pull it up. By the way, I think she was one of the ones that was hair on, so that's kind of interesting that he goes out of his way to talk about not leaving hair. Uh, but um, let me see. I have the list here. Because the if, there. These numbers, if these two numbers, these phone numbers, yeah. mac match up to Megan. Right. Then it's pretty. Right. Then that was her. Then this is her. Operation well, plan. Okay, she so that, that, she disappeared from Maine. Remember that in 2010, she was last seen in the state of Maine. It's a it's a fantastic point that you bring up that this isn't just as oh this isn't an overall whatever because I mean he has specific phone numbers of the victim. Well, on 917 him. is uh, New York. The Bronx. That's what I'm saying. But it's not like he has a list of different victims that he's after he has one in mind uh, he's got the profile he's built a profile he's built where you know where she is who she's around uh, i mean this is and it yep. sounds like in dr gary if you're if, i believe you're probably correct here because he he's identifying akeem cruz which was her boyfriend pimp who had actually, who I, I don't know if he's still in jail, but he has actually copped to sex trafficking uh, women, but he was never considered a suspect. Uh, but so, yeah, you're right. You got to be on the, the ball here, Chris. With you're, you're right. It's got to be just a one plan, one person plan. Well, well, I think Chris is, you know, what he's saying, you know, is something that other offenders have done. I think. Dennis Rader certainly comes to mind as a list maker and a, one of these people uh, I mentioned, uh, David Parker Ray earlier, he had instructions like that. He considered the women he was torturing so interchangeable that he recorded his torture instructions, you know, the details of what he was going to do and how you should behave on a cassette tape and would just hit play and step away from you after he abducted you because it was so checklist like. I mean, I think what this speaks to is that he thinks of a murderer as requiring a blueprint, like a like a person building something, and he's basically laying out his plan, and then probably, you know, if you look at the date book that they've gotten here, would pay attention to when the wife wasn't around, you know, because it, it says, like, you know, that the wife's away in Vermont, the wife's or whatever, and then literally, like, it's like when the cats are away, the mice will play kind of thing. And then he plots this whole thing. I think, I have to tell you, Chris, I really think the women were mostly brought to the house. I mean, don't forget the wife's hair is on Megan, okay. right? So the wife, if the wife, if you exclude, if you think she was involved, there are some people who do. If you don't, her hair could have been in the car. Her hair could have been in the house. But she had to be somewhere where, where the wife had been, right? So yep. where is she, the car or the house or... I just always thought that he brought them back to the house because that's where he had the soundproof room. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and what's interesting here is they're already depersonalized. They're not human when they're in they're, when they're already with him. Just because, projects. yeah. Well, right. they're, they're an event. Yeah. Post event. Yeah, 
they're just, you know, they're just an event. They're just a house. Okay. Where, and what are the problems within the house? Okay. You know, what are our problems? Okay. What supplies do I need to build the house? Okay. And then, great. Now, how do I get rid of all the stuff that I use to build the house? And then, you know, he's got in here, okay, what are, what are my, what are my problems when I'm leaving? Well, he's got 33 cameras that he thinks he has to avoid. And he, on one road, Route 110, he's got 30 more, or exit 30, he's got 10 more. Okay, And then, you know, I've already done my recon on the phone numbers. I can see this list next to him after he's done and going through, okay, I got to get down here, body prep, wash body, inside out, cavities, check, remove trace evidence hair, blah, 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 check. Remove trace DNA. Remove ID marks, tattoos, check. Remove marks from torture, check. Remove head and hands, check. Package for transport, check. Okay, what else do I got to do? Tools and devices, all right, I got work to do. Check. T1, target one's clothes and personal items, okay? Notice he doesn't say T2 on here. So he didn't have to get T2. He got T1, target one. Drop cloths, check. Wipes and towels, check. Props, toys, wood items, check. To your point earlier, right? Anything that touched T1. Notice it doesn't say that she touched, that touched her. Oh, well, that's a very telling but Chris, I think the more we're reading this, I think you're right. This looks like almost like a breakdown that you would do after a project or a task to sort of say, like, how can I improve upon it the last time? So it sounds like a plan for the next one where you're sort of yeah. examining what you did wrong in the previous one and that he seems to be talking about a very particular victim. It's like a it's like a quarterback. Yeah. It's like a quarterback preparing for the defense coming up. Well, yeah, yeah. I think if we get to, yeah, right, yeah, I think he puts her in the car or whatever they whatever he did, and he goes through and he dumps all this stuff, okay, and then he comes back and he does an after action report, and that after action report is things to remember. That's where it starts. This is all post incident. Well, he probably masturbates a while with the photos and. Right. Yeah. Stuff and then right. gets it's rid of it all until the next person. Right. Right. And right. Then he repeats the cycle. Yeah. The whole right. thing is an event from be, from picking right. his victim right. to yeah. disposing of the stuff and then moving on. It's all. It's it all like uh, kind of OC, doesn't it? This is all past tense. Look, look at this. Yeah. Right where he goes, get sleep uh, before the hunt. Too tired creates many pro Too pro creates problems. Hit harder, too many. Uh, hit harder, too many hit to take down. Wow. Consider a hit to the face or neck next time for takedown. Take next time for takedown. Yeah, but Chris, that could also mean that he's hunting a victim with arrows or a gun or something, and he's thinking what he needs to do to bring her down. Yeah. Or like he's yeah. talking about the next time. Or a yeah, but this is time. this is post incident of this hunt. Okay, and now he's saying. Hey, just a couple of things to remember for the next hunt. These are the things that cause me problems on this hunt. I'm not going to do these next time. Exactly. And, and and he's also got in here takedown slash pickup. This hunt was too long. He was seen in the area too long. His risk level is high. Remember, don't charge gas. He almost got, I bet you he probably thought, man, I'm running out of gas. I got to get some gas, okay? And I bet you he was tempted to use his charge card. Right. And he was told, he told himself here, remember, don't do that again. Right. And then recon for video cameras in pickup area next time. So this guy, that things to remember, that was the post-incident debrief of so, this So, so of is this. that kind of how he would, I mean, is this how he would get them in is pretending to be a John. Yeah. Right. And then right. he would some probably punch them in the face or something. 
But right, this Chris? is the investigative, yeah. This is the investigative approach for the interview with him. To go into him and say, you know, hey, Rex, I, you know, let's talk about this for a minute. I, I love your incident report here, what you got going. Uh, I see you got some pre-incident, you know, post-incident, incident. And then I see you've identified what your mistakes are. You know, let's talk about this. You know, the way I'm reading this is, you know, you recognize that you had some problems that you had to deal with. Congratulations. You, you know, you, you threw us, man, for 30 years. You, you did good. I got to give you an E for effort. It, well, and Chris, it, when he says, you know, dispose of the following, mm -hmm. uh, the tools and devices or whatever it is that he, he's talking about, that means that every time he ha he does this, he's got to go get more tools and more devices Correct. Uh, every, every single time. And that's how he's avoided being caught for all these years because now right. he he's tied to a 30 year old murder. And that's why it's a problem under his first category where he puts down trace source of supplies. He's already thought about that. Go back to the page, uh, the very beginning. And just for the audience, we're looking at this document here, right there. Yep. Problems, trace source of supplies. You see, he was already thinking that he's he knows he's buying and this is where dr Picardo is right on target and, and by the way for the listening audience he rarely is wrong i hate to tell you that but he's <laughs> the guy is he does what he does for a reason uh but in this situation well, in this, new york we can't always be right notice this is problems that's plural okay so he knows that if he's getting rid of every one of these items the saw the the all the things the burn can the burn scan uh can drano and all this other stuff he's got to buy these items and he knows that's a problem for him so and that's why he identified it trace source of supplies i would submit to you that he's the dumpsters become very important and that's why he puts in there dumpster site Next time, recon dumpster location. Not only does he have a dump site, but he has dumpster sites. Okay? And that, because I would submit to you that a lot of these supplies, when he wraps up the uh, you know the package for tra package for transport, he's identified where these dumpsters are, as well as where he's going to potentially drop the uh, dump site. DS1. Now that could stand for dumpster site off of Mill Road. And they're reading it as dump site off of Mill Road. I would keep an open mind on that because Rex Hurman has identified it in his own words as a dumpster location. He puts it right there. Next time, recon dumpster locations. Well, so, well Chris, I'm very suspicious though that one of the reasons he misspells words that a person would search for who was looking through his electronics, like right. torture spelled T-O-U-R-T-U-R-E, or instead of saying dump site, dumpster site. I almost wonder if he knew that if somebody was going to be doing an electronic search of hundreds of devices, that you could make it more difficult by misspelling some of the most obvious keywords sure. that a person might put in. And Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what do you think of that, uh, uh, Josh? That yeah, I don't. I don't think that this guy's a dummy at all. He's not a dummy. Uh, I think he's very ca obviously. We're looking, you know, as you're reading through, you know, he, his supplies, his problem. He has he has thought this uh, through, forwards, backwards, upside down, inside out. I mean, this is the, times. This is like his grandma right. had a big Christmas cookies. And it's on his mind. You got a piece of paper. Here you go. First, you right. buy this, then you do that, then you do that. To him, this is like talking about something that's old hat. And I, I would mean, imagine his IQ is probably pretty high. I mean, he's an architect, right? He's no dummy. Uh, and so, what you just said is true torturer. because torturers I, have higher IQs. I've I've shown in my research. Yeah, and that would make sense for somebody not getting caught. You know, it takes thirty years for them to get caught. But the the thing about him is 
he is smart enough to spell things uh, wrong on accident because it would it would make it harder for for it to search. You know, like what did it say? Three hundred devices or some something yeah. like that. Uh, that's a lot. And I'm telling you, one of the things that I have said for a while, and I still insist on. And listen, Chris and I have been making predictions about this case, and we're watching them come true one by one. Don't forget, we went out on a limb and said this guy was was um, torturing when no one else would say that. Now here we have it. Well, and can we right. go back to the um, the uh, Stockholm thing real quick? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I will. Uh, but uh, just before that, I just want to say one thing. The one thing that I haven't seen yet and by the way, it is odd to me that if someone else was participating in these murders, why there's no mention whatsoever about coordinating with another person, which is odd. Um, but uh, let's put it this way. He did at least some things alone, right? Yeah. I think, I think you'd agree, Chris, this is a solo plan here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> what I think has not happened yet, but I think will. Maybe I'll be wrong but it would make this guy very different than a lot of offenders like him is that somewhere in that house or somewhere near that house, like a locker or something like that, there is a stash of mementos that were probably taken from victims, pieces of jewelry, ID cards, things like that. There have even been offenders. And I just spoke to uh, Dr. Ramslin about this today. There have even been offenders we both could think of because Dr. Ramsland appeared on uh, a different program after I was on Cuomo. She was on the same station. I think she was supposed to be on Banfield. So we were talking. We had looked at the document and we, we agreed that a lot of these offenders give some of those mementos that they've stolen to their wife or their kid. And they say, I bought you this, ba this bracelet. I got you this. Well, I found this, whatever. And the twisted idea behind it is that then when you're being intimate with the person, they don't realize that in your mind, they're also the victim. They're this person you've done horrible things to and right under their own nose. Right. And um, so I think somewhere there's a trophy stash. And I don't know if you agree with that, Chris, but most of these guys have a trophy stash. And this guy is a collector and a hunter. Uh, it is very hard for me to believe there's not a box somewhere with stuff taken from people. And it could be anything, you know, anything. Now, based on this guy, it's not going to be anything identifying like hair or teeth or something. But I think it might be jewelry, you know, things like that, personal effects. What do you think, Chris? Probably hidden somewhere in the house, right? Yeah, so absolutely. He's got something somewhere. Oh, yeah. uh, it could be in South Carolina, could be in Nevada, uh, yeah. but he's he's got it. I agree with you 100. percent No, it's like interesting. Like Goldberger's knife, if Goldberger right. killed those kids, that that knife is somewhere, and he knows it. Absolutely. So here's a question for you: When what you when did Megan disappear? 2010 from Maine it was the last time she was seen. Okay. And the first victim now is 93, so we've already got 17 years of activity. Even just with those two. Okay, so this is a modified document in 04. It originally, the the stamp on it was 2000. And then it was originally titled HK 2003. Now, here's a question. It could be another right. Megan. Uh -huh. It could be another Megan, or it could be this is the version of the plan that he developed at that year and then kept it. You know, like this is version two and it progressed for years and years yeah it could be embedded on the computer as that um file right. that kept changing it and updated yeah. it right right thank chris yeah so it's a planning document they they came to the same conclusion i'm, right. I'm up at reading that but they don't seem to think that it's for a unique offense they think it's like just an overall i i don't know i'm not uh grabbing that one yet Personally, okay. because, well, because, because it's too specific. Well, it's too. Right. Go ahead. No, I'm saying that you and I think that, but there is one place in here where it says the task force came to a conclusion 
about it, about their interpretation of it. And, right. Um, it says I got. I'm going to find it, but they interpreted that as. Um, oh, here we go. As set forth about the embedded on 28, the Gilgo Homicide Task Force members believe these reference these uh, references to next time indicate Hoyerman's prior experiences and what changes to implement moving forward. So it's like it's a snapshot in time where he's like visiting the past and thinking about the next one. So obviously it's a moving target depending upon what has just happened with them. So he's, he's modifying each time, I guess would be the idea. Well, that's what I said, a cut and paste. Yeah, exactly, right. So John, Douglas, cut and paste. Yeah. John Douglas is named in this. Yeah, it, his books that were that were, were referring to early. Yeah, he studied them. Yeah, no, I know. I, it's just seeing seeing his name on the uh, the application is wild. Well, he's he is very important in the no world. Doubt. We love him. You know, he's a hero in the troop. But unfortunately, you know, those of us who write these books know that they get studied by offenders. And um, listen, when I wrote the New Evil, Vernon Gabert, the venerable Vernon Gabert, was on the phone with me, and he said, Gary. Just know that one day you're going to get a phone call from an, an officer who's going to say, sir, we found your book in the possessions of a man who did some terrible things. Yeah, and, what's uh, yeah he's right. So what's interesting in July of 2003, for seven days, his wife was out of town. Oh, yeah. I don't think he kept the victim for an hour. Let's put it that way. So when did she go? When did she go missing? He's well, got they, they call. say they coincide. They say they coincide with the wife being out of town. Yeah, and, the, and we know that John Ray questions that, but the task force thinks that. Yeah, he's got calls on the twenty first, right? Of um, so which is, let's see, all the way to the twenty fourth to Vermont. Omaha, Nebraska. So the, I don't know who these calls are to, but it could be his wife. But let's see here. Travel to Jeffersonville, Vermont. Yeah. Mm -hmm. July 20th through the 27th from Manhattan to the Smuggler's Notch Resort. So then he's also got here, they've got in here electronic data, AT&T. Okay, so they're showing that the wife was out of town um, right. but they're saying that his daughter was in second grade or kindergarten god well chris if you look at pages 12 13 14 what do you what are you picking up from their phone records that they give you uh, that these were phone calls to the wife at the resort from his office that's oh, what's like that she's away at the time. Yeah, that she they're showing that she's not what they're trying to do is keep her out of the circle. Okay. Or, 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 or in the circle. Go ahead. He's calling from his office or a cell? His office. So if he's got a victim all those days, she's sitting in that sound uh, booth, probably. And he's going uh, to work. Yeah. Right. Going right. to work, doing his thing. I'm um, gonna ask my yeah. question now about Stockholm. Right. So what's your so, understanding of what Stockholm syndrome is? Well, I think fr from what I understand, I don't, I don't really understand, but I, from what I understand, it's not an actual diagnosis or, or whatever. It's just because you can't really study Stockholm syndrome, but what I'm talking about is what? with you saying that, you know, he, he didn't keep her for an hour. Um, why is he bringing up Stockholm syndrome? Is he trying to get somebody that just w wants to stay around? Is he keeping them around that long to where he thinks that they could end up with some something like that? Well, so Stockholm syndrome is a psychological phenomenon where a, a person who's been held captive or who's being tortured actually starts to develop a bond almost a care right. for the person that is doing that to them this is probably an evolutionary mechanism whereby we have to bond with caretakers even if they're horrible like little kids that 
have to love a parent even if the parent's abusing them because the if they don't the parent will not take care of them right and they'll die so they learn to kind of develop a a kind of a positive feeling to which is an awful thing but it does happen uh you know chris how many times have you had to talk to an abused kid who defends the parent yeah. or scared of them sometimes and sometimes that they're dependent on them um and sometimes uh, you know it it's a a kind of a a maneuver like a, a way to kind of dissociate from the reality of what is happening to you because it's too horrible and it, it's like if something was bad enough you start to say well maybe i i do have some will in this maybe i enjoy it maybe i want it rather than saying oh my will has been taken away i have no identity anymore and but so what's interesting about it is that in order to develop stockholm syndrome you have to be with somebody a while right right and what i find disturbing about him wondering about stockholm syndrome is is the idea that he's enslaving somebody for days on end or that's and, that that's my question because you, you're, he's got all the like what is this a, a day type situation one day one night or are we talking weeks here well he makes these notes um under you know these are things that he basically takes from john douglas okay and he's saying there spur of the moment cover stockholm syndrome the more you do the more clues you give look at the painting what why who that's a right out of john douglas that if you want to know the artist you have to look at his painting so the idea would be look at the victim and then you'll know the psychology of the offender right because the, the crime scene is their artistic output in their mind as horrible as that image is john is right that that is an important technique for crime scene under, insight i think you'd agree chris yeah. that we see it as like an output of a brain right and um and then you see he's studying john's idea of uh, well not john's only but the behavioral science unit idea of organized versus disorganized and then notice the discussion of sex substitution sex substitution and mutilation being signs of disorganization so sex substitution is where he is talking about not being able to use the penis to penetrate a victim and using objects instead and that's very important because i think there was some of that that with this guy um it almost makes you wonder if he was intentionally doing that to make it look disorganized to throw people off the trail right mutilate take a I, you know put an object in the we don't know because we don't know what happened to these people but it certainly sounds like that's something he might have been interested in or done now regarding right. stockholm syndrome i agree with you that it's very odd that he would say something like that unless he's just taking notes from john's book about it like what would happen if you kept someone a while but it makes me think that he certainly had at least the fantasy of having a long-term slave or or entrapped person uh because you'd start worrying about you know or thinking about that after time now uh but chris that would be impossible to carry out i mean he seems to have had limited time to keep a person and i guess what he's trying to say in his own document is well, maybe if we could create an airtight enough place, I could keep her someone a while. You yeah. know, I could, you know, keep her as long as I want. And that's so sad in a pathetic way because I've always said from day one with this guy, when we barely knew him, when I went on Channel 12, when I, the key to this guy that everybody seems to forget is, is it's pre puberty. It's the idea of, I want to control when a person leaves. Remember, he was about 12 years old when his father dies. We still don't know how the father dies. For all we know, the father could have killed himself. For all we know, the father could have been, you know, died of a disease. He could have died. We have no clue. And I have to tell you that I think he was very traumatized by the death of that man who left him with the mother that he was described as having a strange relationship with. He was a mama's boy, quote unquote, but it was a kind of manipulative dynamic and, and a condescending dynamic, I think. So that this father, who's kind of romanticized in this guy's eyes, dies when he's 12 years old. And then the house 
is kept like a shrine. Right. So I, I just think, you know, as we kind of wind down here, um, Chris, we have to think about the idea that um, hanging on to a person would have been the ultimate goal for this guy and probably why he stopped dismembering. Yeah, he, st- he was definitely interested in what that Stockholm syndrome was all about uh, because, uh, you know, person, right. yeah, to your point, Gary, it gives him definitely much more organization over that victim and control. Oh, yeah. I, I, Chris, I think uh, Josh's question was a good one, and I didn't hear one person ask about it on any show or anything. But it's a very astute point because it makes you think that the long-term goal was to make a victim stick around a while. Yep. Yeah, and I've always been very fa- uh, interested in Stockholm syndrome. I, re- I remember reading about like its origin, uh, you know, from the bank and all that kind of stuff but in Stockholm. And Patty Hearst was who they thought was yeah. subject to the Stockholm syndrome. And on the notes when that popped up, it just st- struck my eye, and I go, "Well," and then Dr. Gary, when you were saying like, "Well, I don't think he was just keeping them for an hour." Uh, yeah, it was, it was very, um, telling when I saw that. So that, that, thank you for answering that. It, it's fascinating. Yeah, but, I, but I think that what you did by drawing attention to that is I think you got right to the heart of what I think all this stuff is really about, which is to render relationships permanent and predictable, because I think that's exactly the thing with this guy is, is that, you know, people and relationships are not like an architect building something they're not a science it's it's kind of hard you know and he's trying to make a science that had to like get a person turn them into an object express feelings towards them get rid of them and then maybe even like keep traces of them somehow that you could visit and that's the other thing we have to think about is if he's keeping people in burlap you know out and they're not dismembered was he revisiting them? Was he driving past the dump site with family and getting a little secret smile on his face like a lot of these adventures do? And even more horribly, was there any necrophilia? Yeah, I'm going to be curious. That's got me curious as well. And I'm sure there's much, much more to come on this case, oh, man. As Al Jolson said, you ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you for listening to The Witness Box. On behalf of Dr. Gary, Chris McDonough, and myself, we want to thank you so much for supporting us and what we do. Thank you for listening. Take care.